I did with him. I said, glory to God. Would you turn to Romans 16, please, this morning? Aren't you glad you're in church today? Stood in jail with a hangover? Or? <laughs> Having tore up your car last night and blew all your money and, you know. How many understand it's a lie that sinners have more fun? It's a lie. You know, I'd like to find somebody having more fun than me. I'm going to ask them how you do it because I'm going to come up some more. But uh, I know it's not through sin. I said I know it's not through sin. There is pleasure in sin for a season, brief. The Bible says so. But the end of it is death. That's why the Lord tells us not to do it. Not because he wants to spoil our fun, because he wants to spare us from death. And how many know you can be dead while you live? Yeah, the Bible talks about it. Living death, that'd be a sermon, wouldn't it? Hmm? A lot of folk are in it. But you can get out of it, because God will forgive you, and he'll cleanse you. He'll help you get straight and stay straight. Right? Help you get free and stay free. Glory to God. He loves you. And he'll help you if you'll give him something to work with. And that's really what we're talking about. Giving him something to work with. Romans 16. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, we have extra Bibles. We'd be glad to let you use one of ours. Raise your hand and, t and take one of these Bibles and turn to Romans 16. Romans 16, and next to the last verse, Romans 16, 26. It says, Now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. Now, you'll find this phrase other places than here in the New Testament. And the concept of faith and obedience hooked up repeatedly. In fact, you can't separate them. can't separate faith from obedience. People try. If you really believe God, you trust Him, you will obey Him. You'll do what he's told you to do. And again and again, the reason people won't obey him is because they're afraid. Or they don't, you know, they don't, they're not sure he's going to come through and, and they just, they cannot be persuaded to obey. And you cannot be disobedient and rebellious and be a person of faith. Doesn't work. Said out loud, if I'm a person of faith, I'll be, I'll be obedient. See, hence the phrase here, the obedience of faith. Now, what is uh, obedience? Obedience means to comply, to yield, to do. What does rebellion mean? There's one word that kind of stands out when you look up the definitions. It is the word oppose. Oppose. You can feel it. It's spiritual. I've been talking to people before, people that were supposed to be under me in some capacity, correcting them, trying to be nice about it, telling them what I, the way we wanted it done, and you could just feel it. What? The Bible talks about stiff neck. That paints a picture, doesn't it? Everybody show me what a stiff neck is. What does that look like? Hmm? Don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing. You don't need to tell me my business. I've been doing this for five years. 
Opposition. Resistance. You can feel that wall. How many know what I'm talking about? If you've been married over three days, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you got kids over a year old, huh? Or six months, you know what I'm talking about. You have sensed, you have seen it, you have heard it, the face of rebellion. It is opposition. It is resistance. It is no, I'm not going to. You can't make me. Now we live in the generation of no, you can't make me. I'm not going to. It's nothing new. It's been around, but oh man, you just see it everywhere. And the problem is people don't see a problem with it. People act like it's normal. And therefore, acceptable, oh, it's not pleasant, but you know, he's just going through the terrible twos, and they're just going through those teenage rebellion phase. You're not supposed to have a rebellion phase. You're not supposed to have one. Well, he's just going through a middle-aged crisis, you know, and he's just kind of a rebel without a cause. Well, that's how you can get messed up with God. It's how you can miss his will for your life. If you weren't with us, we got into it last week about Saul. And if you hadn't been with us, I highly recommend now that you get caught up, go, go, get online, download it for free. Go back to the word supply. Get a CD or a DVD. Free, no charge. How many know what no charge means no excuse? You can't say, well, I don't have any money, so I couldn't get it and get caught up. Well, no, it just means you're lazy now. Because <laughs> it ain't costing you anything. Except, I mean, you've got to walk by there to get out of the building. <laughs> How many extra steps we're talking about? And if that's too much for you, don't, you're sitting at your desk, you can click your mouse. <laughs> right? Amen. Download it. <laughs> or you can just not care. <laughs> uh, what did we see about Saul? We saw in Saul, I mean in the, in the famous chapter where Samuel by the word of the Lord told him to obey is better than sacrifice. Right? To, to pay attention and listen and do is better than the fat of many rams and offerings and sacrifices. He said rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You do understand most people in our generation don't see that. They don't see it that way. They don't believe that. They're like, well, you know, I, I'm a little stubborn. I guess everybody's got a little stubborn streak. That's exactly like saying... I, I worship idols a little bit. You know, nothing serious. And so, yeah, you know, once in a while I get, I get a little rebellious, but, you know, it's just part of me being cool, I guess. You know, that's just kind of my persona. Yeah, that's exactly like saying, you know, yeah, I practice a little witchcraft here and there. Nothing too intense, but, you know, a little. Is it true? Is the Bible true? Rebellion, is it, as, is it as bad as witchcraft? Yes. Is stubbornness as bad as praying to a rock, yes. worshiping an idol? Yes. The Lord said it is. And we saw Saul lost his place. Oh, my, it's sad. It's sad. He lost what he was born to do in this life. He lost what he was called and what God had anointed him and picked him out and put him in this place to do. He blew it. He lost it. And he never got it back. And he died wrong and young. And God said, I wish I'd never put him in. That's a huge statement. It repents me that I ever put him in. God said, why? Over what? 
Not because of him being Saul, because he changed after he got into office and he became proud and he became disobedient and rebellious and would not listen. Let me go over the face of this again. Uh, now, I'm, I'm trying to move to something else. So stay with me. Don't despise this. Let, 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 get, get solid on it. S somebody say it out loud. Not me. not me. Well, how's it going to not be you if you don't even recognize it? You've got to recognize it in Him and recognize it in yourself. Right? Uh, what did we see in the face of rebellion in Saul? We saw, I'm going to give you just a handful of things. We saw pride. He was proud. He had this grandiose plan of his triumphal parade and he wanted people to see him and know he was big shot and important and when it started going wrong, he got upset. He got angry and bitter about it and upset. These are all indicators of rebellion. Do you see this? Pride and the anger and the bitterness, and also, along with pride, is hurt. Yes. You know, whether you respond in being mad or whether you respond in being hurt, it can both be indicators of pride and rebellion. Also, he was deceptive, mm -hmm. wasn't he? Yes. Rebellion is deceptive. He said, I did do the commandment of the Lord. I did do it. But you know, the people... The people, well, he's the king. They're following him. Rebellion is a deceiver. And you, I mean, you see this all the time. And parents, watch this in your children and don't let them get by with this. Don't let them tell you they didn't understand when you know they did. Did you hear me? Yeah. Amen. Well, I'm just, you know, giving them the benefit of the doubt. For the 80th, 80th time, follow your heart. You know in here. What you told them, you can see it in their eyes. You can hear it in the tone of their voice. Don't you let them get off of everything by looking at you and go, well, I didn't really understand what you were talking about. That's deception. Oh, it's ugly. You call them on it. You look them in the face. You say, boy, look at me. <laughs> I'm thinking of my daddy right there. Oh, <laughs> thank God for a daddy like my daddy. He didn't know everything. He wasn't even in the Word that much, but he grew up in a Pentecostal home and he had some things in him. And there are times he'd look at me and he'd say, Boy, look at me. I thought, Oh, God, this is it. Now, I, mean, you know, I mean, it's over now. Don't even think about lying. I mean, just, you know, what the, didn't, you know what I told you and you just go, Yes, sir, yes, sir. I know, yeah. Take your medicine. Right? And, and you need that. Children need their fathers and their mothers to be like this with them. That's love. That's real love. People say, well, I love my child too much to do that. You don't love them enough to put yourself through the discomfort. And take the time when you're tired and don't feel like fooling with it. You don't love them enough to put forth the effort to do it. Don't let them get by with it. Call them on it. Somebody say, call them on it. Call, look them in the eye. Say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know you, you understood me, didn't you? Call them on. And just, and just stay there if it takes an hour. Stay there till you get this thing straight. Because if they don't learn it with you, they're going to blow it at school. They're going to blow it in their sports. They're going to blow it at their job. They're going to blow it with their spouse. Did you hear me? And they can blow it with God in the call on their life. They can wind up like Saul. That's why the Bible said, children, there's that word, obey your parents. Why? Huh? So that it'll go well with you and you'll live long on the earth. You should learn these things at home, early, young. It's easier. Also, they wouldn't take personal responsibility, kept blaming it on the people. Argumentative. That's pretty obvious. Rebellion is argumentative. He said, I have done the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, what's that lowing I hear? Those sheep and those goats. What, what is all that? He said, well, 
The people got some stuff, but I, I did it. I did the commandment. Deceptive and argumentative. And finally, and this is the big one. Did Saul repent with Samuel? No, he did not. That's obvious. Now, if you don't see that, don't take my word for it. Go back, study the passage, see it. He would not repent. And here's the big deal. What if you disobey? What if you're rebellious? What if you mess up? Is that the end? Does God just write you off and say, well, forget you? No. No, it's not the end. You can blow it so terribly. You can be as mean as can be. You can just throw off all restraint and be so rebellious and so disobedient and God will still forgive you and still bless you and still use you if, if you will humble yourself and repent. That's the big deal. How do you get to the place where God says, I wish I hadn't put them in there? How do you get to the place where you lose it and never get it back? It's not because you got rebellious. It's because you wouldn't repent. Do you hear this now? You get to the place where you stiffen your neck, you harden your heart, and, and you don't care who it is, and you don't care what they say, you're not giving in. You don't care. You're going to have it your way. You're going to do it your way. If you push that long enough, you can ruin things for yourself. You can get things where they can't be fixed. That's not my words. Listen to the uh, Proverbs 29 again. He that being often reproved hardens his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. A man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Whoever stubborn, stubbornly refuses to accept criticism will suddenly be broken beyond repair. If you get more stubborn every time you are corrected, one day you'll be crushed and never recover. But now, did you hear this? Often reproved. That's the deal. Often and repeatedly. And again and again and again. And you just won't, you won't, you won't, you won't. That's when you get to that place. Somebody say, not me. I will repent. I will yield. I'm not rebellious. I'm a person of faith. Let me give you two statements that the Lord gave me. I was uh, in about my, I don't know, fifth year of ministry. And I was really busy speaking many times a week. And I was studying people that had been used in previous generations. People that are in history books, church history, uh, people mightily used of God. I was wanting to see, you know, what they knew about God and, and how they got to that place. And uh, I saw person after person, man after man, woman after woman, miss it. As you studied their history, in, in their midlife or later, get off and die young or die wrong, and I saw it again and again until it just bothered me. And I thought, in fact, it was so strong on me. One day I came into the speaker's room. I was about to speak in healing school. And I, I fell on the floor because it was so strong. And I said, God, I can see that these people, these men, they knew more about you and saw more of your power and saw more miracles and amazing things, uh, you know, in a few years than I've ever thought about seeing. And some of them were brilliant minds. And, and could quote half the, the New Testament, some of them. And, and, and yet, they got off. They got into error. They got messed up. They misled people. They died young. They died wrong. And I said, I see. I can't be assured I won't get off because of my superior intelligence or because I know more about you than they did. I don't. Or because I've seen more of the, your power. I haven't. How can I... Keep from doing that. That's what I was asking him. And he spoke to me. It's etched in my heart. I said he spoke to me. He did. 
I, don't, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I mean very distinctly in me. It's etched in me forever. He said, son, so sweetly, he said, every one of those men and women you're referring to, he said, I sent people to them to correct them, and they wouldn't listen. He said, everyone, and one of them I knew about because Brother Hagin had told me personally God had sent him to. And another one, uh, uh, if I called names, uh, uh, well known in, uh, in Christian circles, and he went to a man who, if I called his names, had huge crowds in uh, amazing healings and died young and died wrong. And he went to him and pled with him. He said, you're my brother. I've never seen anybody used like you in this particular area, but you're trying to teach over in this area, and it's wrong, and you're leading people astray. And he said, well... I want to do it. He said, well, maybe you do, but it's not your call, and it's not your grace. And he wouldn't listen. And not long after that, he's gone. And the Lord said to me, he said, I sent people by every one of these. I warned them. I tried to help them. And they got where they wouldn't listen. And he said this to me. He said, Keith, son, your humility is your protection from deception. You want to know how this can keep, how you can keep this from happening to you? Simple. Remain teachable. Remain correctable. You get off, I'll help you. If you don't see it, I'll send people by you. I'll send people to you. I'll send things across your path. The question is, will you hear it? Will you listen to it? Will you be correctable and teachable? That's the question. Said out loud, my humility, my humility. is my protection. From deception. What does pride do? <coughs> Stiffens its neck. Hardens its heart. I'm not going to listen. I don't care. I don't care what you say. That's how you get. You know, if you do that, it doesn't just happen the first time. But if you do that repeatedly, that's what the Bible said. Eventually, you can get to the place where, boom, destruction will come on you just like that. And it can't be fixed. And so that, that scares me, Brother Keith. It ought to shake you. Because this is serious. Did you hear me? It is possible to get hard-headed and stubborn and rebellious and ruin your life and miss God's plan for your life. Somebody say, not me. Not me. 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 By the grace of God, God. I'll be teachable. teachable. Hmm? Hmm? These two statements, if you didn't write them down, the first one I gave you, your humility is your protection from deception. Here's another one. If you remain correctable, you remain restorable. If you'll remain correctable, I don't care how badly you've blown it and how, you know, much of an idiot you've been. If you remain correctable, you will remain restorable. God can restore you no matter how much you've messed up if, if you'll listen and obey. Go with me if you would to uh, Deuteronomy the 8th chapter. Now some things don't make you shout as much as others. But they're all needful. You know, just personally, I'd rather preach something to you uh, and tell you something every service that just made you shout and run the aisle. <laughs> boy, you can tell we're having fun today, can't you? Oh, boy. Mister, well, why don't you? Well, there's this thing called being led. There's this thing called praying and hearing from God that kind of messes with that. And if you really do, then you'll get things that you didn't think of and that you wouldn't have chosen, but uh, somebody else did. I mean, I, personally, I would not have chosen to talk to you about that in the offering today. Personally, I'd rather not. I'd like, hey, you know, you take care of your business, I'll take care of mine. Let's be happy, you know. 
But uh, how many know daddies are not supposed to just hide behind the newspaper and the TV and the only thing they know how to do is pat you on the head and go, oh, you're a good kid. Yeah, you're a good, good kid and daddy loves you. There's more to it than that. There are times when you've got to do stuff that's not fun. You need to deal with things. Right? It's not going to go away by itself. You've got to call it. And that's what being a pastor is, being a daddy. And uh, I hope you know we love you. That's why we tell you the truth. And whatever I preach to you applies to me. Right? So I'm talking to me too, every time. So uh, Deuteronomy 8, did you find it? Verse 1. What are we talking about? The obedience of faith, and we're excited about it, right? Huh? Look at your neighbors, see if they're excited. <laughs> huh? Remember, we're faith people. Stir yourself up a little bit. Deuteronomy 8. He said, All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear to your fathers. I'm telling you, every time the Lord tells you to do something, He's either trying to protect you or He's trying to bless you. Every time. Smart people would just obey. Verse 2. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to what? Did they need to learn some things about humility? Now some people spend more time in the wilderness because they are so slow. <laughs> right? What was them spending 40 years in the wilderness, was that the perfect plan of God for them? It was not. Hebrew says it was, it was finished from the foundation of the world that they're to go into the promised land. The first generation did not. Never went. Why didn't they go? Because the walls were too high? The giants were too big? No, because the next generation went in. Big walls, iron chariots, and giants and all. Right? Why didn't they go in? We know the, the answer is unbelief. But what is, what's coupled with unbelief? Hmm? Unbelief. You know, the, the Bible talks about ignorant unbelief. But then it also talks about, if you look up the word, the word means unpersuadable. Unpersuadable. He couldn't persuade them to obey him. And they had multiple opportunities. This is the perfect example of that scripture we looked at that if you refuse to be corrected and reproved and you harden your heart time after time after time, there'll come a place where, boom, that's it. You're going to lose it, you're going to miss out, and you can't get it fixed. That happened with this generation, didn't it? It started while they were back in Egypt. And he began to instruct them, and what was their standard response if he said, do it? Hmm, have y'all read the Old Testament? Uh, we're, we're reading our chapters right now, right? How many understand? Most of the time when he told them to do something, what did they do? They argued. They, t they said why they couldn't do it. And here he says, He said, You remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Look at that phrase. I know, I know some folk may not enjoy it, but look at it. To humble you, and what else? Prove to prove you, and to know, to see what is in your heart, whether you would obey him or not. Everybody say, prove it. Prove it. prove it. prove it. What is proof of faith? Obedience is proof of faith. Faith without works is dead. What did we find out about this group? 
Would they obey him or not? No. First generation never would. Do you know why there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Hmm? I mean, wouldn't it have been a lot simpler if it just wasn't there? If it wasn't there? No command to say, don't mess with it, don't eat it. No temptation to eat it, right? We'd all still be in the garden. No sickness, no curse. Hmm? No war, no famine, no crime. Hmm? No earthquakes. No cold weather. No too hot weather. No tornadoes. How come that tree had to be there? To prove them. I said to prove them. That, I mean, some things can only be proved if there's an opportunity to choose another way. True love, true faith, true faithfulness can only exist when you've got a choice. Did you hear me? Got to have a choice. Or else, why is it, it, you know, you're not going to see it. What did Adam and Eve prove? Not good. What did these, the first generation of Israelites prove? Not good. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You've proven what was in your heart. But here's the thing. By the grace of God now, under the new covenant, can you change? Can you? Can you cease to be rebellious and sinful and disobedient? Can you become an obedient child of God? And can you prove that you believe God? No matter what. Even though you didn't do it in the past, can you do it now and in the future? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But... You won't do it just by talking about it. You'll have to prove it. Hmm? And we are proving things every day. Aren't we? And, you know, people don't, don't think about it, but we are either qualifying or disqualifying ourselves for future positions. I'm talking about in this life, but beyond this life. God holds highly faith and faithfulness and they are inseparable from obedience. He said to prove you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandment or not. He humbled you and suffered or permitted you to hunger and fed you with manna which you knew not, neither did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, out of the Lord, does man live. He proved them. Listen to Judge, we just read this recently in, in Judges 3, didn't we? Four people, judges, we're reading judges. Huh? How many read the chapters this week? I mean, surely the whole bunch hadn't backslid here now. Huh? Oh, yeah, good. I saw a bunch of hands go up. Well, I mean, you're laughing, but the Lord's talking to us about disobedience, rebellion, adultery, right? Well... No matter how bad it's been, we can get it right. We can get it right. His mercy endures forever. We can get it straight. (laughs) Uh, He must say, well, I don't don't like all that. I don't like it like that. Well, if you look hard enough, uh, you'll find somebody that will tell you you're okay just like you are. If you'll go to enough churches and groups, you'll find somebody that'll pat you on the head and tell you that your sin is okay. But you'll still be miserable. Or, 
Or you can hold yourself in the light of God's holy word and let it show up whatever it shows up. And believe you can deal with it by the grace of God and get free. And become somebody that you've never been. Become more like Jesus than you ever imagined you could be. And be a real daddy and a real husband and a real wife and a real mama that your grandkids will talk about in days to come. Right? Be a real man of God and a woman of God. People look up to and respect and will follow. It's yours. Belongs to you. Judges 3 that we read here recently. He said all these nations the Lord left to prove Israel by them. Verse 4, they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken to the commands of the Lord. To prove. There are tests that occur regularly in life. And what's it going to do? It's going to prove you. It's going to prove your heart. Whether you believe or you don't. Whether you trust or you don't. Whether you'll humble yourself and submit or whether you will harden yourself and resist. Whether you will obey or you will not obey. Now what if you don't pass the test? Will you be equally blessed? You won't. You'll forfeit things. What if you do pass the test? Oh. These things are necessary. I know it. you get into some of the wisdom and sovereignty of God some of it gets a little big for your head to to wrap around but these things are necessary for God to promote you and bless you above other people did you hear me if God does things for you that he doesn't do for somebody else if he promotes you and blesses you and prospers you and keeps you healthy and does things for you and your family that you don't see just everywhere he's got to have a reason why Because the Bible says that he's the righteous judge of all the earth and he is righteous no matter. There are people that will try to condemn him and say that he's not fair, but he will be proven just. And he will be justified when he is condemned, Romans says, or judged. And he'll be able to hold up and say, well, the reason I was able to do it for them, they believed me when you wouldn't. They obeyed me when you wouldn't. They passed tests when you failed them. Right? I had every right to bless them. Had every right to keep them. They obeyed me. Now, 2 Corinthians 2 9. By the Spirit of God, Paul writes to this church. Don't turn there, but 2 Corinthians 2 9. He says, I, To this end I did write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. Somebody say proof. 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 I love the Lord. I love the Lord with all my heart and I just want to serve Him. I don't care what it is. Prove it. You get to a point where talks just talk. Prove it. Hmm? Mop the floor. Well, I would, but I've got this and I've got that and I just don't feel like that's really my call and my place. Well, and you'll see people that get so irritated with leadership will like, Why do you think you have to tell me every little detail? I'm intelligent. I've been doing this for years. Why don't you just turn it over to me and let me do it? We'd be fools. (laughs) If you won't follow this little instruction, and we're going to turn it over to you, we'd be fools. Do you see this now? This is how God is. If you're thinking about putting somebody over a company, put a broom in their hand. So sweep that sidewalk. See what they do with that. If they don't do that, you can't go any further. We're, we're stuck. We're stuck. I'm quoting scripture. He that is faithful in that which is least would be faithful in much. He that is unfaithful in the little thing, he would be unfaithful in more. Go to Exodus, please. 
Need a few, few more minutes today as usual. Of course, 12 o'clock is not our normal get out time anyway. And of course, it might appeal to some people to have an early service because you know what time you're getting out. Somebody says, I'm going to come to the first one just to see the miracle. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've done it before. If you've ever done TV or radio or classes, you, you have to stop right on the dot. But, you know, to me, it's a luxury that we have time, you know. And, uh, you know, I know sometimes people's, you know, flesh gets a little antsy, but, oh, man, sometimes just taking a few more minutes with something, you get revelation that you would have missed otherwise. Now, you can, don't misunderstand me. Preachers can keep going after they get through. I'm sure I've done it. But unless you've preached before, don't throw any rocks. It's not <laughs> as easy as it appears. Uh, <laughs> Exodus the 16th chapter. Everybody say tests. Yes. Proven. 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 Adam and Eve had the uh, tree test. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. How'd they do? They failed. they failed it. Did it cost them? Yes. Oh, Lord. Oh, oh. Oh. They failed the tree test. What was the tree test? Don't eat of the fruit of the tree. Don't, don't do it. Were they confused about that? Were they, hmm? Nope. What happened? How, how come them to do it? Hmm? Yeah, looking. Somebody said looking. That's, that's how it starts. That's right. The Bible said the woman saw. They're out there hanging around, looking, thinking. And, and when you do that, when you're look, see, you, you're already yielding. You're already in disobedience before you pick the fruit. Do you see this now? And, and here's the problem. Every step of obedience opens the door wider for the devil to tempt you and talk to you you're actually tuning in to his channel. You're giving him an audience. Do you see this now? And, and every step you go makes it harder for you to resist and go away. So when the moment they're hanging out there looking, now it gives the devil an opportunity to reason with them. Do you see this? Now he has the, the chance to explain to them and lie to them how they're not really going to die, but what's going to happen is you're going to be like gods. You are going to, you know, and, and implying God didn't tell you this because you're really going to die. He just wants to keep you away from it because you'll be like him and you really won't need him anymore and you'll be gods yourself. And they fell for it and just disobeyed and failed the tree test. And here he mentions that he proved them. And he mentions the manna situation. So Exodus 16 here is the manna test. I want us to look at the manna test. Why are we studying these things? These, these things are examples for us, the scripture said. Let's see if they didn't pass the test. Let's see why they didn't pass it. So we can learn from it so we can pass ours. Are you there? Yes. Exodus 16. You focused? Yes. Let me find it. You know, I'm talking while you're turning, so. Exodus 16 says, They took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Zin, and between Elam and Sinai on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel were praising God and thanking God. 
Oh, no, that, that's what they should have been doing. They were murmuring against who? Against the leadership. This is a dangerous thing to do. And it happens all the time. Murmuring against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, the children of Israel said to him, Would to God we'd have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Wish God would have just killed us in Egypt. We, we sat by the flesh pots. Man, we had, we had stew. We, we ate bread till we were full. And you brought us up out here in the wilderness to kill this whole bunch with hunger. Man, they got short and selective memories. They were slaves. Wasn't so rosy back in Egypt. The Lord God said to Moses, I will rain bread from heaven for you. The people will go out and gather a certain rate every day. Why? Why? Get some insight. Why did the Lord do this like this? He could have done it any number of ways. Read the scripture. Why did he do this this way? Hmm? To prove them. Somebody say to prove them. To prove them what? Whether they will walk in my law or no. How are you going to know? How are you going to know somebody's heart? How are you going to know if, they, if, they, if it's true or not? If they're deceptive or honest? If they're faithful or unfaithful? How are you going to know? It comes down to this. Situations come up. And what you do or don't do overrides all your talk. Right? Prove it. It'll come to pass on the... He said... Uh, on the sixth day, they'll prepare what's brought in, and it'll be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, that even you'll know the Lord brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning, you'll see the glory of the Lord. He hears your murmurings against the Lord. Uh, what are we that you murmur against us? So, uh, let me see. Skip on down to verse uh, 12. The Lord said, I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Say it, even you'll eat flesh, and in the morning you'll be filled with bread, and you'll know that I am the Lord your God. It came to pass that at even quails came up, covered to camp. And in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay up was gone up, behold, on the face of the wilderness there was a small round thing, as small as hoar frost on the ground. When the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, manna, which means, what is it? And they, and they wist not what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. In other words, go get it. There's your bread. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Now, why did he do it this way? Why did he command it this way? To prove them. See what's in their heart. Gather it, every man according to his eating, an omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take every man for them to his tents. The children of Israel did so, gathered some more, some less. And uh, everybody, you know, he that gathered much didn't have anything over. He that gathered little had no lack. They all had plenty. Moses said, let nobody leave it till the morning. What's going on here? It's a test. Right? Now, you know what the devil will come do in a situation like this? Hmm? Don't keep any of it overnight. The devil will come and he's ready to reason with you. Right? What will he say? Why? I mean, we're out here in the desert. What if we're not able to get any more? And if it spoils, I can just throw it out anyway. And if it don't, I'll have some extra. I mean, that's just being a good steward. That's just using some sense. Hmm? This happens continuously. Well, I don't know why they want us to do it that way. I don't see why. Exactly. There's a test going on. Hmm? 
That's exactly right. That's why you don't see it. If you saw it all and were in full agreement with it and it's your idea, then it wouldn't be any test of your obedience or your faith or your faithfulness. So what did they do? They hearkened not to Moses. Some of them left it till the morning and it bred worms and stank and Moses was what? He was wroth with them. Some said, well, that's not very Christian. It's a perfect expression of how God was feeling. He is representing what God is feeling. How much then Moses came in the next day and, and, and people are throwing out this stinky, wormy stuff, and what did he do? What? What? You mean you kept it overnight? What did God tell you to do? Somebody says, oh, 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 that's verbal abuse. Oh, 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 I don't feel the love. You need to read about love. Love gets mad. Love gets upset. Love will call you. Moses was wroth with them. He said, what? What is wrong with you? God told you don't keep any overnight. What didn't you understand about that? <laughs> no, well, we just, we just thought uh-huh. clueless about what is even going on. Clueless that if they do this another several more times, they are forfeiting their whole future in the promised land. That's right. That's right. Do you see this now? This ain't just about manna. This ain't just about pancakes on Saturday. Hmm? What's it about? Well, I just don't see the point. You don't have to see the point. That is the point. Will you obey when you don't know why? Well, I just don't see why it's such a big deal. Read your Bible. You're either passing or failing. You're either qualifying or disqualifying for the big stuff right now. God says don't, lay, don't, don't save any of it. What do you do? You do not save any no matter why you, what kind of idea you have. You don't save. So on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, just like the Lord told them they would. And the Lord told him, Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath. Bake what you'll bake today. Seethe what you'll seethe. That which remains over, lay up for you to be kept till the morning. Now he says, Save it overnight. Uh-huh. Right. Doesn't he? Yes. Well, so, well, which one's right? Why can't they make up their mind? You want me to save it or don't save it? Rebellious. Right. Yeah. Well, I just don't see what, you know, why, why can't we just make a rule? And everybody do the same thing all the time. Let's have rules. Where I used to work, we had rules. Here is the rule in the kingdom. Be led by the Spirit every day and every night. That means sometimes you save it and sometimes you don't. Well, I don't... That's confusing to me. How would I know which, which one? Well, can you hear? <laughs> we, can you just do it without questioning and arguing? Some people won't. This, peop, this bunch wouldn't. They would not change. No matter what happened, they wouldn't, they wouldn't change. So he said, tonight, save it. And... and uh, Verse 25, eat today, the day of the Sabbath, today you will not find it in the field. Six days you gather it, but on the seventh day there won't be any. So he said, don't go out to get any tomorrow. Save what you got tonight, don't go out tomorrow. So naturally, what did they do? So they went out early the next morning. Why? Come on, help me with this. Put, you, put yourself in, in their shoes. You were there. You heard it. You've, all, you've already seen the other deal, how Moses got upset. Right? 
You were one of the ones that kept some last time, had worms in it. <laughs> but what's your reasoning? What, how, how do you have to reason to get up early and, and go disobey? What, what gets you to that place? You're thinking, well, it's the desert out here. And we don't know how much longer this is going to last. I mean, I mean, this could be food that could keep us from starving another few days. Right? And I've got to be a provider for my kids. I've got to do what I, I'm just. I'm not just going to sit in my tent. Well, there might be food out there for my babies. And if, if there is none, well, there is none. I've made a trip for nothing. What's lost? What's the big deal? Hmm? What's the big deal? Let me tell you what the big deal is. Whether you wander around in this scorpion, snake, dry desert and die young, or whether you live with pomegranates and figs and orchards and palm trees and houses you didn't build and vineyards you didn't plant and orchards you didn't plant, houses filled with all good things that you didn't have to sweat and get. That's what it is. That's what it is. Difference between can you sit still when you're told to sit still. That's what it is. Oh, friend, this happened time after time. Can you see it? Now, I hope you, you'll read it with a different eye. When you go back and read these things, look at it now. In fact, go to, go to Numbers 14 real quickly. I think I can close with this. Numbers 14. It culminated here. The testing that had began in Egypt culminated here in Numbers 14. Numbers 14, are you there? The Lord told them to go up and possess the land. Back over there in the uh, 13th chapter. Hmm? Didn't he? He said, now you're here. There it is. I have given it to you. Now go get it. God says. When God says that's yours, I've given it to you. Go get it. What should you do? What should you do? You should do everything in your power to possess it. Now, just because God gives you something doesn't mean it's going to fall in your lap. Hmm? The giants were living in it and thought it was theirs. And had walled cities and iron chariots and all that. And, and they, they sat in their tents the first part of chapter 14, the first verse, they said, we can't do it. They're giants. We're like grasshoppers in their eyes. They're going to kill us. They're going to stomp us. And they cried all night in their tents. And they said, I wish we'd have died in Egypt. What is this? Now, some people would say, feel sorry for them. Bless their darling hearts. This is just so overwhelming for them. And they've really been through a lot. You know, being slaves and all, and, and it's been rough these last few days. And No, this is rebellion. They're rebelling against God, sitting in the tent crying. Oh, friend, get this picture now. Rebellion is not always mad, and I ain't doing it. Rebellion can be, I just don't know why you talk to me like that, and I don't understand. I said, look, I can't do anything right. Nothing's ever good enough for you. Rebellious. Rebellious. Deception. They know, they know better. Lying. Trying to act like they don't know. Joshua and Caleb tried to talk them out. If they said, man, guys, we're here. We're here. Let's go. God's with us. Their defense has departed from them. We can do it. Come on. Come on. We can do it. And all the people said, 
Stone them. Kill them. Huh? Unbelief does not like faith. <laughs> and uh, verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me? Is believing and obedience go together? Yes. Why are they not obeying him? Because they don't believe him. They don't trust him. And he told Moses, let me just wipe this bunch out. They're not going to listen to me. We've been through this repeatedly. And the Bible says in verse uh, 22, get this now. 22 because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times. Everybody say ten times. There were ten major events that they failed. They failed. Everything that was proven was that they were rebellious. In fact, I won't take time to read it, but he said, I've, I've seen this people. They are extremely stubborn, one translation said. They are a stiff-necked people. He said, Every day, from the day I have known you, you have been rebellious and disobedient to me. How long before you obey me? And they wouldn't, and they wouldn't. Can you see it? If he says, don't lay it up, what do they do? Lay it up. He says, don't go out, what do they do? They go out. Then he got down to this. He said, go in the land. They wouldn't go. Get down to the end of the chapter. They said, well, he said, all right, that's all right. Go back to the desert then. You stay in the desert. They said, oh, no, no, we'll go now. We'll go. And he said, don't go. I won't be with you. So what'd they do? So they went. <laughs> What's wrong with them? <laughs> Has anybody been like them since? Huh? Do you have to be like that? No. No. How many like what we're reading about now in Judges? And Joshua, what what they do? They went in and got it. Didn't they? I mean, it starts off good. They had some problems later, but, you know, they did. They went in and somebody finally obeyed God and had a miracle and had a victory. Can you say amen? amen. Go to Second Chronicles 33. Let me close with this. The Lord says, how long till they obey me? How about let's not make any wait? How about let's be in obedient today? Now you might say, well, Brother Keith, now don't quit me now. This is, this is one of the best parts where you're just getting to right here. Uh, you might say, Brother Keith, I, I guess it's just my nature. You know, it's my, uh, it's my Irish, uh, it's my Native American, it's my, it's my Scottish, it's my, it's your flesh. <laughs> and there ain't no excuse for it. You can say all you want to, but, you know, I guess I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm proud. That's who I am. I'm a strong man, and I'm proud. No, that's weakness. That's weakness trying to make out like it's strong. So insecure, you're not strong enough in yourself to, be a, to, to submit yourself and to obey. You feel like you've got to prove something to everybody. Show everybody that you're no doormat. That means you're insecure and weak. When you're strong, you're not trying to prove something to somebody. You just are. Are you with me? I want you to see, though, the mercy of God. Lest you get the wrong idea, because I know how the devil is. He'll try to jump on people and say, well, that's you. You messed up, and, and you're done. You have lost your place. You won't be able to get it back. You're just rebellious. Ain't no help for you. You're always going to be rebellious, and you know it, and I know it, and the devil knows it, so just be rebellious. Just enjoy it while you can. Well, it's not enjoyable. It's miserable. Even, even when you're getting your own way, you're unhappy. 
But I want you to see something that just to me is a trophy of the mercy of God. Are you there in Second Chronicles? Second Chronicles 33. I want you to see there's hope for you. <laughs> if you're awake, by the time we get through reading this, I think you will know there is hope for you. No question. There is much hope for you. Second Chronicles 33.1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and five years in Jerusalem. Now, how long is that? Fifty-five years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. <coughs> he built high places that Hezekiah, his father, had torn down. He reared up altars for Balaam. He made groves. He worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord. Oh, did you get this? He built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He built altars to false gods in God's house. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He burned his babies alive to false gods. He observed times. He used enchantments. He used witchcraft. He dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He set a carved image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God, of which God had said to David, to Solomon, in this house in Jerusalem I've chosen before all the tribes of Israel, and I'll put my name forever. Verse 9, Manasseh made Judah. Remember, he's king. What if you don't want to go along with this stuff? Die or do it. He's king, made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Second King says, uh, don't turn there, said he shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. I want to ask you, what did this man not do? It'd be hard to think of something evil he didn't do. Burning babies alive? Setting up idols of the Baal and Ashtoreth in the house of God? Killing innocent people from one end of the nation to the other. Making the people serve these gods. He lived with evil spirits. He had witches all over the palace and wizards, and they're doing all kind of, any perverted thing they can do. I mean, wouldn't this kind of be the extreme of rebellion and disobedience to God? And listen, verse 11, Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Syria, who took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. What if he'd have done that before you and he burnt your kids and grandkids in the fire? Huh? Think about it now. You, you got to keep in mind what this man did. He did perverted, terrible, nasty, wicked stuff you hadn't even thought of and shouldn't think of. But now, another kingdom has come in, took him over. He's captured. He's a prisoner. And he hits his face. And he repents. 
And he humbles himself and asks God to forgive him. And he prayed to him, and the Lord was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem and put him back in his kingdom. And Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. This is amazing. Isn't it? What I wanted you to see is if you harden yourself and will not repent time after time after time after time, it will come to pass that you'll be destroyed and you'll lose things and there won't be any fixing it. These Israelites, they did it ten major times. They failed all the tests, no matter they wouldn't obey, and they lost out. They lost their place. Not because, not because they rebelled and were disobedient. Why? Why? Come on, somebody help me. Why? They would not repent. They wouldn't humble themselves and repent. Here's a man gone to the depths a human being could sink to. And after he's blown it and lost it, he repents genuinely. He humbles himself after all his witchcraft and all killing all these innocent people and destroying all these children and all the stuff that he did. He said, God, I repent. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. God heard him. God forgave him. God brought him back to his kingdom. Put him back on the throne. Tell me why. Tell me why. He humbled himself. He repented. It's never too late if you'll repent. Oh, can you see this? Stand on your feet, please. Glory to God. Sing yes, Lord. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. Oh, yes. Sing it real strong. I say yes, Lord, yes, yes to you. Forgive us for rebellion, disobedience, not listening, being unwilling to be corrected or instructed. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We will change. We will repent. We ask for your help. We ask for your anointing. And by your grace, we will obey. We will believe you. We will follow you. You're faithful to us. We'll be faithful to you. I'll listen. I'll do it. My answer, today and always, anything you say, Yes. I say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. To your will and to your 
communion over this this morning and it can be a pillar in your life how many know in the bible there were times when significant things happened people's names were changed their lives were changed they'd set up a pillar before the lord pour oil on it or offer up a sacrifice and name it and it was a stone it was a mark in their life and it's all going to be different now said out loud my rebellious days are over my disobedient days are over. I take communion over it. It'll be different from here on out. Be seated. Ushers come. Keep your eyes open until you're served. Either sing with the singers or, or pray, but keep your eyes open until you're served. And don't be in too big of a rush. Now, this is holy, and we're going to do this. There's power in this, isn't there? There's power in this. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Go ahead. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can Nothing but the love 
anybody today if you've not been served raise your hand you might say, well I hadn't been living right brother Keith well that's why he died that's why the price was paid you can repent right now and get it straight don't miss out join us amen and if you're watching by internet in uh, if, you, if you're not prepared today in times uh, to come on the first Sunday of the month, we normally have observed communion together. Get you some communion elements and get them there with you and partake with us so you can do this part too. Hallelujah. Amen. Y'all can come. Oh, the blood. price already paid. Friday night we got to shouting about it. All we like sheep have gone astray. Went our own way. But he paid for it all. He paid for our rebellion, for our disobedience. Aren't you glad? Amen. So we can be obedient. It costs a lot to pay the price for all our sins and rebellions and mistakes 
It did not come cheap. But Jesus paid it all, and we honor that today. And we believe there's power in what he did to enable us to live obedient lives. Don't we? The scripture said, I received of the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Hold up the bread, everybody. Said out loud, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord for, offering up your body. for offering up your body, allowing yourself, allowing yourself to, be to be beaten by your bruises. By your bruises. We're, healed. We're healed. Thank you, thank you. for making us a part of the body of Christ, Christ. we acknowledge acknowledge and respect respect the other parts of the body, body. anybody Anybody that believes in you, you, loves you, you, serves you, you, that's born again, again. we love them, we We respect them, them. matters not not. what titles over their door, door. We we reverence and respect the body of Christ. Christ. Break and eat. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I'm healed. I'm healed healed by his stripes. By his his bruises. By his his beating. I am healed healed. and whole. whole. I'll live long. I'll live live strong. strong. With long life, life, he will satisfy me. me. I'll see his salvation. His His will done in my life. life. Glory to God. The Bible said after the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped and he said, this cup is the New Testament, the New Covenant. In my blood, this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Hold up the cup. Everybody said out loud, Lord Jesus, Jesus, I honor your blood. blood. It's on the mercy seat. seat. In In heaven, it makes me innocent. It makes me clean. clean. I honor the blood blood that sealed the new covenant. covenant. I'm in covenant with you. I I have faith with you. I have faith in your blood. I I am not a covenant breaker. I am not a a rebellious son. I I will not disobey you you. and harden myself against you Thank you for cleansing me from all these things that I have done in days past. But I'm a new creation. It's washed away. I'm clean, made right from all unrighteousness. I am clean by the blood. Take and drink. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Are you really, really clean? No matter what you've done. If God can forgive a man like Manasseh, a baby burner, if God can forgive a man like him and restore him and put him back in his place, surely he can forgive you. Me, anybody, anywhere. Stand up on your feet, please. Remember to put your receptacles in the trash can. (coughs) 
Yep, Phyllis says, remember the meeting, the volunteer meeting. It happens right now, right here. I have faith in you. I believe in you. You know, Paul, excuse me, uh, Jesus looked at Peter and he said, you're going to deny me. You're going to you're gonna mess up. He said, and Satan's desired to ruin you, sift you, destroy you. He said, but I have prayed for you. And when, not if, when, when you get straightened out, <laughs> not if, when, yes. Yes, yes. I want you to strengthen your brothers. I believe men and women in here, changes are happening inside them today. And in days to come, they're going to be husbands look at wives and wives look at husbands and go, you're different. You're different. You're not like you used to be. And y'all both need to say, thank God. <laughs> you're different. Employees are going to look at you. Employers, I'm trying to say, are going to look at you and go, Man, you've become such good help. We're going to give you a raise. You know, I used to not even like coming by your station because I knew you'd just argue with me, but you've just been a joy to work with these last three months. I, we're going to promote you. Are you listening? I believe. Do you believe it? I believe this is happening. Changes. Glory to God. Well, if you confess Jesus for the first time today, you are born again. There are going to be people standing along the front ready to talk to you. Anybody got any questions about salvation, don't go out the back. Come down, make a beeline to the front. But we're going to sing it as good, obedient soldiers. We're going to go saying yes. What's the answer when the Lord says anything? Sing it for you. Say yes, Lord, yes. Oh, yes. 